Shalom. That's what I've been learning. Thank you. <laughs> Sleek, I'm not fluent in Hebrew. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're right. Um, uh, thanks to everyone for be staying around till six o'clock. Thanks to Rick for, for inviting me here and Paul for hosting. Um, my talk tonight is on the immunology of religion, and I'm going to trot out some uh, new ideas tonight that I've been working on, and I've probably tried to stuff too much into a 45-minute uh, lecture or talk than I should have. So hopefully we can make it through. Um, I'm going to start by putting my talk in a little bit of a context with some dominant theories of religion that have been uh, sort of popular over the past 20 some years. Uh, and one of the questions, of course, that comes up is why do people engage in religious behaviors? And one theory that has enjoyed great popularity is what's been called the costly signaling theory. And this sort of addresses the notion that um, it's hard to get people to cooperate without cheating on each other. And the idea is that um, when you get people together, who, especially who are not genetically related, you might find that someone will want to take all the benefits from a community's uh, common wealth uh, and not put in any of the costs. And so, and we've already heard the name tonight, Richard Sosis has pointed out that the costly signaling theory of ritual posits that religious behaviors or rituals are costly to fake signals that advertise an individual's level of commitment to a religious group. So you're going to have to sort of put up some some sort of cost that's hard to fake. It has to be sincere and you probably can't really recuperate from it without ultimately having the group uh, do it for you. And so this raises the question of a commitment to what I call cooperative economics. Everybody's willing to buy into the common pot and then enjoy all the fruits thereof. Um, interestingly though, um, what I'd like to suggest is that insofar as religion has been ubiquitous and persistent throughout time and world cultures, one of the questions I like to ask is, does religion address certain selection pressures? And we've already seen with the costly signaling theory that it maybe addresses this idea of the need to cooperate. Competition may be more, especially among non-genetically related people, competition may be more natural than cooperation, so religion comes along and helps to maybe facilitate and foster that type of cooperation. In addition to that, and I'm not going to say, I'm not about to argue that costly signaling theory doesn't have its role to play in the explanation of religious behaviors, but I'm going to argue that if we look at selection pressures over time, cooperation may be being one of them, but a lot of literature of late will suggest that infectious disease may be the most robust selection pressure on the human animal. That in addition to cooperative economics and mac what I like to call macro predation, predation due to big cats, packs of dogs, and strange others or strange conspecifics. So uh, Benjamin Hart has noted that the existence of disease causing viruses, bacteria, and parasites represents a major force shaping behavior that is arguably as profound as the forces having to do with predator avoidance or resource utilization. And so here he is ultimately sort of pointing to these three different selection pressures that the human animal had to face. Uh, interestingly, uh, Richard Sosis and I think at the time his graduate student, Candace Alcorta, have noted something similar. They write that the costly signaling theory of religion does not explain why shamanistic religion should focus on healing. And if we think about some of our earliest religious priests or shamans, maybe one of their fundamental roles was in the business of healing. Uh, and I thought this may be appropriate for our location, but if we look at Matthew 4, 23, we note, and he, Jesus, ostensibly went throughout all Galilee, healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So uh, maybe the attraction of Jesus might not be so much the ethics from the mount, but maybe some of these miraculous healing practices that, he is, uh, that have been attributed to him. Um, we can also know that Fincher and Thornhill then note, the nature of religion needs to be reconsidered. Although religion apparently is for establishing a social marker of group alliance and allegiance, at the most fundamental level, it may be for the avoidance and management of infectious disease. In which case, I raise this question, is this commitment a commitment to cooperative hygiene? Is religion potentially a first stab at a public health policy? In this regard, we can know that Pichapin has argued the immune system is the most important biological system affected by the evolutionary pressures of infectious diseases. Now, if we look at the immune system itself, um, oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> I think you can work with me on this one. Um, 
there, of course, when we think about the immune system, we would probably think immediately about the, what we can call the classical immune system. And this is the immune system that kicks into gear when you actually become infected. I'm willing to argue, though, that the immune system is more robust than that, that we actually see two other registers. One's called the behavioral immune system, and this has recently come up in some of the psychological literature, and then maybe perhaps what we can call a mimetic immune system. And I'm going through the course of this talk, I would like to address how religion may possibly play on all three registers in a proactive way. Uh, just real quickly here, the classical immune system is basically divided into two systems. Uh, we have the, what's been called the natural one, which is a general rapid response. As soon as you're infected, these uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, the tumor necrosis factor uh, alpha, these come straight onto the scene to fight the infection. Over here, we have what's been called a specific local or adaptive. And this is the part of the immune system that once you become exposed to a disease, you actually get take on immunological memory. So if you survive your disease, and this is why we have vaccinations, on next exposure, second exposure, you'll have a more robust uh, uh, effect, a more robust response. We're going to come back to this towards the end of the talk. Recently in the literature, though, what we've seen is the behavioral immune system. And this has been associated with uh, Mark Schaller at the University of British Columbia. And they've raised this question. The classical immune system is calorically expensive. When you get sick, and we've all been sick, and we know how calorically expensive it is, this is when you get the fever, this is when you get fatigued, and this is when you sort of start shutting down. So uh, Schaller and some of his colleagues started asking this question, well, wouldn't it have been adaptive to sort of somehow come along and develop a system to stave off infection to begin with? So don't just wait around and become infected. Look for signs of diseases in the environment and then act accordingly accordingly, behave accordingly to forestall infection. So they note a set of mechanisms that allow individuals to detect the potential presence of parasites in the objects and individuals around them and to engage in behaviors that prevent contact with those objects and individuals. We also know Valerie Curtis suggests that humans have hygiene instincts. Disgust, a primary emotion, is the name we give to the motivation to behave hygienically. I've done some other work on disgust and religion, and we may get into some of that today. But here, the, again, the idea is that we seem to be, um, even though we might not consciously recognize it, we're constantly monitoring the environment to see where a potential infectious disease agent could rest. Now. <clears throat> What we can say then is that what we see is that infectious disease ecologies often correlate robustly with collectivism. And so and if you look at some of the sociologists, they'll suggest that we can categorize cultures as even being collectivist or individualist. And what we seem to see is that collectivist groups sort of start gathering towards the equator where robust disease ecologies are the most prevalent. As you move away from the equator, you start seeing more individualist cultures emerging. So what we can see then is that if parasite transmission is influenced by social barriers, then parasite control may provide a basis for the evolution of social groups under a particular set of ecological circumstances. Now what we can, I can further note is that just as specific kinds of physical barriers, waterways, mountain ranges, create island biogeographies, specific kinds of psychological traits, low levels of extroversion, low levels of openness to experience, and specific kinds of value system, collectivism, create insular social geographies, island social geographies. So that the idea then is that certain cultures, ideals, and values may actually create uh, sort of isolated groups just like a physical barrier might. Our ideas start creating boundaries between different groups. Um, Fincher and Thornhill note, collectivism is fundamentally anti-pathogen psychology and is associated with higher ethnocentrism and xenophobia. So again, there's this notion of if, and I may believe this, this next one, religion diversity is the highest where infectious disease severity is also the highest. So what we see happening is that in these robust disease ecologies, you have groups proliferating and basically setting up boundaries from contact with these potential others. I'm going to fill this in in a moment. And in Fincher and Thornhill have called this the parasite stress theory of human values and sociality. 
What we can note, and, and this maybe makes me a little anomalous to this conference because my primary uh, interest in historical traditions is with the South Asian ones, Hinduism in particular. Um, one of the things that's come up is why is there so much caste collectivism in South Asia? Where did caste come from? Uh, the historian McNeil notes that the taboos on personal contact across caste lines and the elaborate rules for bodily purification in case of inadvertent infringement of such taboos suggest the important sphere of disease probably had in defining a safe distance between the various social groups that became the caste of historic Indian society. So what we know today, and, and here I've given you a very simplified image of the caste system, the Varna system, with its classical four, the Brahmins, the Kshatriyas, the Vaishyas, and the Shudras. And the thing is, though, is that uh, Hindu society and the divisions between the Jatis and the Gotras and the Varnas is so robust and so some people, some sociologists have even suggested that Hindu India is the most socially complex and diversified group in the world. And the disease ecology in Hindu South Asia, if you've ever traveled to India, there's no chance you get there and not somehow come down with something. Um, so what we can note is that uh, the relationship between religion and purity may run deeper than mere symbolism. In fact, it may be the byproduct of an evolved psychological system known as the behavioral immune system. Now, some of you may know the work of Mary Douglas, uh, the anthropologist who's w done work on purity and danger, and she wants to make purity and pollution codes ultimately and only social. It's all about, you know, if dirt is somehow matter that's out of place for the social system. Terizzi Jr. and his colleagues are now asking this question, maybe these purity and pollution codes actually have something to do with biology. Maybe it actually has something to do with hygiene, and so the social and cultural anthropologist may have be a, a little bit off on on one register. Um, so here one of the questions I'm asking is, are religious customs somehow hygiene codes? And again, we're raising this question of, does religion somehow come in for cooperative hygiene and public health systems? What we know is that some have argued that castes are endogamous groups. Purity of caste is essential, and violation of the endogamy rule involves pollution and punishment. Now, one of the things we can say about Hindu South Asia is that not only is there an emphasis on caste endogamy, sleep within your caste, there's also an emphasis on caste commensality, or who do you eat with. So Hindu India in particular is very concerned with whom you eat and with whom you sleep. And what we know is that these are the two primary behaviors that are most conducive to the trans transmission of an infectious disease. Uh, so one person in particular at Pachapin has then argued because of this caste endogamy, each caste becomes a breeding isolate. You breed within your caste alone. What we can also note then, and this is what I suggest, this then leads to what I have called the geography, and there was a geographer earlier, I believe, the geography of immunocompetence. Local groups become immuno immunologically adapted to the local disease ecology. You become adapted to the local disease ecology, you thereby can survive. Um, Interesting thing for me then is that caste endogamy ultimately amounts to what I like to call a prezygotic isolating mechanism. And what we know is that uh, isolating mechanisms are one way of obtaining speciation. And so you might have certain other types of isolating mechanisms, but prezygotic pertains to some isolating mechanism prior to copulation. And if you have these groups that have these notions of you can't sleep with that other person from that other group, it's an idea. Idea, but it becomes what we can say is a prezygotic isolating mechanism. And the curious thing is, we see this playing out in the genetic code. Uh, so Majumdar has pointed out, social regulations govern the institution of marriage have resulted in a substructuring of the Indian gene pool. What's more, the sympatrically isolated caste and subcaste populations of southern India in particular, with differing breeding habits, differ significantly in their HLA and other immune repertoire. So let's be sure. The HLA stands for the human leukocyte antigen. It's on, found on chromosome 6, and it codes for the immune system. So these groups who are living together but ultimately have different ideas about with whom you can sleep, you actually start seeing these structures show up or these differences and these boundaries show up in the immune repertoire itself on the genetic system. 
Uh, lastly here, much of this socialization and acculturation occurs during childhood within the context of familial interactions. So collectivism looks like it correlates robustly with disease ecologies. It looks like it's having an effect on the genetic codes of these people sympatrically isolated, they're living near each other, but they're not sleeping with each other. And now the idea is that maybe collectivism in all this is enculturated during childhood. This is fascinating, I think. And I think we're going to see some of this tomorrow. Um, but it leads me and led me in my research to ask questions about child rearing practices. Right? So if, if it takes a family or a parents to uh, inculcate children for a collectivist lifestyle, um, we do know that grandparents and parents should seek to inculcate pro-social, mutualistic and altruistic behavior among the descendants over whom they exert pervasive psychological influences during early child development. And this I think is, I, I think Dr. Palmer will probably address some of this tomorrow. This is that notion of descendant leaving hypothesis. You want your children to be pro-social with each other and then your grandchildren and on down the line, maybe unto the fourth generation, right? That's an illusion. Maybe you picked up on it. Um, but here's the idea. If you look at the ethnographic record, it appears that there are two predominant styles of child rearing. One's been called pediatric and one's been called pedagogical. Right? And the idea is that pedagogical child rearing strategies are the ones where parents are proactive in teaching the children social and emotional moorings and whatnot. The pediatric style of child rearing doesn't go in for that sort of social uh, enculturation. The pediatric style of child rearing looks, according to the ethnographic record, looks like the parent is most interested in the physical well-being of the child, not so much in emotional development. And we see this in the ethnographies of pertaining to Hindu child rearing practices. Indian mothers, so the record suggests, will not emotionally and empathically engage their children that they're physically, they're indulged in physically, but they won't ultimately engage in this sort of emotional one-on-one -on -one love type relationship. This is what uh, Robert Levine at Harvard University has called the pediatric style. And here's the thing, the pediatric style of child rearing is correlated directly with disease ecologies. So he writes, in this pattern, pediatric style, in this pattern of infant care adapted to the risks of disease and death in the earliest years, there is no place for an organized concern about the development of the child's behavioral characteristics and social and emotional relationships. Such concerns are postponed until later in his life. And here is an image that I brought, uh, took from um, uh, uh, Stanley Kurtz's book, All the Mothers Are One, where he wants to suggest that the child is near the mother and the mother's constantly monitoring the child's well-being, but she's not engaging with him like we might see in this image here. What we note then, uh, as Susan Seymour, who's working directly with Indian child rearing practices, such practices probably keep young children actively engaged in dependent seeking type activities with others. In this manner, an active form of interdependence among family members is again inculcated. So the argument that's being made here is that the mother doesn't necessarily engage emotionally with the child, but the child wants to emotionally engage with the mother, and this keeps the child consistently looking to, to get uh, support and response from the mother. What I'm willing to suggest is that the pediatric child rearing practices is a type of practice that in ultimately leads to what we can call uh, a facultative insecurity. I don't know how many of you have worked with John Bowlby's work, but this gets us into attachment patterns. And if you know John Bowlby's work, you'll know that Bowlby talks about the secure, the insecure anxious, and the insecure avoidant. What I seem to see in my research and others that I'm borrowing from is that insecure, anxious individuals subclinically tend to be more interested in commitments and connections to a group. And when I talk about something being facultative, I mean that it is actually somehow um, adaptive to the particular environment. So we know that Ayn Doris and his colleagues has pointed out, evolution generated a capacity for facultative development of attachment patterns in response to 
environmental pressures. Here's the thing about Bowlby. In 1969, when he writes attachment, he makes it seem like secure attachments are a cross-cultural universal normative developmental pattern, such that if you're called insecure, anxious, somehow you're falling beneath the mark. Here's the thing. I'm willing to argue that throughout evolutionary time, hundreds of thousands of years ago, secure attachments may not have been the predominant style. I'm willing to suggest it may have been insecure, anxious if our parents our forebears' parents were constantly having to hunt, gather, forage. They weren't necessarily there to play games with us. So what we can note then is that anxious attachment may be more compatible with a highly collectivist culture in which tight interdependence is regarded favorably. So if you have a robust disease ecology for which collectivism is a prophylactic way of organizing your society, one way of raising your children to develop that adult collectivist personality is to engage in a pediatric child rearing practice that is also in response to an infectious ecology. So finally, uh, I endure note, the adaptive advantages of insecure attachment patterns may be that they promote survival of individuals in a group rather than directly promotive reproduction. So let me put it, give it to you uh, schematically here to just make the point. I'm willing to suggest that if you have an infectious disease ecology, Pediatric child brain practice is the way you're going to go in for it. You're going to, you're going to be so concerned with the well-being, not psychological or emotional, but the physical well-being of your child, that this psychological emotional is an afterthought. That potentially leads to an insecure, anxious attachment style that promotes an adult collective group that itself could be a prophylaxis against disease contraction, transmission contraction. And this is what I'm willing to suggest. This is what we see happening in Hindu India. How, to what extent this applies to Judaism, I'm going to defer to the group. So that's the behavioral immune system. Let me talk about the mimetic immune system now. Right? Um, some people, Susan Blackmore in particular, maybe you know that name, has argued that religion is a memeplex. Memes, and this is something that I didn't come up with uh, uh, with Rick's talk, maybe some hairstyles are now memetically driven. And then, you know, some cultures just want them here, some cultures just want it there, but that could be a memetic system, again, for tribal sort of identifications. You wear your hair like this, I can sleep with you. You wear your hair like that, you're off limits. So. Is religion then a set of ideas that sort of hang together? In which case some people, perhaps provocatively and controversially, have suggested, can you become infected with religion? Now if you ask someone like Richard Dawkins, he's going to say, absolutely, right? Richard Dawkins can't believe people are still religious, right? But it's, so some people will ask, well that's because they can't shake the memeplex. So we can note, the virus cannot control contact with other religions, so it takes prophylactic measures to keep people blind or unreceptive to other religions. Religions. And, and, and my own, I, some, you're asking me about teaching religion in the South. I do have students whose parents say, don't take Professor Ellis's class because you don't want to be exposed to those memes. Right? Now, one of the interesting things is if disgust as a primary emotion was there to say, oh, that's nasty stuff, I shouldn't put that in my mouth, ew, yuck. Curiously, psychological research now suggests that we have some similar reactions when we come across other people's ideas. So for instance, um, Ritter and Preston have talked about icky atheism. And I've heard people talk about that dirty atheist or that dirty materialist, right? There's nothing dirty about being an atheist. I mean, you could you know, you know, protest. But the idea is that people sort of come along and when we hear things that we don't like, we ultimately have that sort of reaction of push it away. It's dirty and disgusting. So we can find that people may become literally disgusted by contact with an outward group religion. Contact with rejected religious beliefs may be perceived as a threat to one's spiritual self and so be rejected by the same intuitive emotional mechanism. Right? So we see, you know, those that dirty whoever other religion. This is all part of that xenophobia and that ethnocentrism that can in effect be part of a prophylaxis. And this is comes from um, this is a picture of, of a book by a Ray who has in fact suggested that um, we are infected with our religions. <laughs> so 
one of the things that I'd like to suggest then, um, and this is something I'm playing with now, is this notion of religious commitment and stress management. Notice there's this notion of, you know, if you come across something that doesn't agree with you, you kind of, you know, you're like, I don't want to think about that. I'm going to go reject it I'm right out of mind, right? I want to ask this question about stress. Um, Many of us have stress through our lives, of course, right? You may be stressed now. Um, what we can know, though, is that there are two types of stress, acute and chronic. And I'm going to argue that potentially religion is in the business of stress management. Now, what do I mean here? Well, let's take this for instance. Acute stress lasts for a period of minutes to hours, and chronic stress persists for several hours per day for weeks or months. So you can be sort of immediately stressed out just for a short period of time, or you can sit there biting your fingernails for months on end until I'm completely stressed. What we know that is that chronic stress is likely to exacerbate pro-inflammatory diseases and increase susceptibility to infections and cancer. So one of the things that we do know, chronic stress is bad for your immune system. Right? It's not good for your immune system to constantly suffer from a long-term stress. We can also note that immune dysregulation associated with psychological stressors can downregulate both virus-specific antibody responses and, importantly, T cell responses to antigens. So, not good to be chronically stressed. We're going to come back to acute stress in a moment, right? Because there is going to be a difference, and a very interesting one, I think. So, let's think about this then. Um, what are our chronic stressors? What is it that can chronically stress us out? Well, for one, feelings of isolation and loneliness, loss, reduction of status, humiliation, helpless entrapment, and danger. Feeling lonely, feeling lost, and what's going to become important for us, feeling like you're out of control. In experiments with rats, and we're not rats, but within experiments with rats, if a rat is put in as a situation of constant uh, unpredictability, constant no sense of control, the rat starts breaking down behaviorally, it starts running down. Also, we can note that religious doubt is associated with the chronic stress. Um, here, I've given you a little picture, probably some of you may know what that refers to, and death awareness. So here are some of the things that will be a chronic stress for us. Loss, lacking control, religion. I don't know, I don't, and one of the interesting things, and I'll come back to this, some people pointed out that religious people are healthier and happier, and some people wanted to make that connection, well then the atheists must not be. The curious thing is that's not the case. The curious thing is that hey, Richard Dawkins is, trust me, he looks very happy to me. <laughs> what looks to be the case is that people who doubt so it may be the chronic agnostic who has a little more problem than the committed theist or atheist, right? So what we can note in this regard then is that, well, what about religion and chronic stress? Go figure. There's a negative relation, right? So what we find with uh, religion, oftentimes there's a perceived social support and optimism. This may go back to our first talk today. Maybe these Cubans weren't finding the social support system that they needed, and so they wanted to join a group, the Jewish group, that clearly had that social support system in place. Um, we can also note, I think that's going to make a move, Terror management theory, some of you may be familiar with this, uh, and their studies have suggested that yes, it does indeed seem that people who are religiously committed do not seem to have the same anxieties about the terror of annihilation that others might. Um, Religion gives us hope. There's a sense that maybe there is a positive outlook on the, on, the out, on the horizon. Maybe we can't perceive it just now, but certainly it's there. So we do find that optimism and social support have emerged as mediators of the religiousness and adjustment and the spirituality and adjustment relationships. The empirical data bears this out. If you're religious, you seem to have more optimism and social support. And lastly here, religious beliefs and practices can comfort those who are fearful or anxious and return a sense of control, right? So here we, we find then is that religious commitment seems to be directly an antidote to the chronic stressor. Now, if we turn then to what I've recently uh, called in a paper I just published in the Method and Theory and the Study of Religion, I call them the adaptive illusions of control. 
Right? What I'm suggesting here is that some perception of control styles, such as the illusion of control, may decrease vulnerability to depression by reducing the likelihood of becoming discouraged or hopeless in the face of negative life events. Now, illusion of control, I'm not taking credit for that. That goes back to a 1975 paper by Ellen Langer called The Illusion of Control. And what she basically showed is that people ultimately sometimes believe they have more control over an uncertain uh, outcome than not. This is your classic, and here you probably see it, this is your classic superstitious behavior, right? Cross your fingers, right? Throw salt over your shoulder, right? These are complete, these kinds of behaviors do not have material physical efficacy, but it gives us a sense that somehow we maintain a modicum of control when there might not really be any. What I'm willing to suggest is this could possibly apply to religion as well. So we also note that religious beliefs and practices can comfort those who are fearful or anxious and return a sense of control or reduce the need for personal control. And this is Harold Koenig, um, who's done a lot of work uh, and what we're basically talking is psychoneuroimmunology. Uh, um, here's the thing. I'm willing to suggest that what we see going on here are two forms of control. And this is what I've addressed in my recent paper. I'm willing to suggest that we have two types. We have an illusion of control and we have an illusion of qualified control. Now, let's be sure. An illusion of control I associate with magic. Superstition. This is the notion that the magician sees some sort of esoteric pattern and can manipulate it by doing his or her esoteric behaviors. You know, you tap your talismans together and you can make, you can compel something to respond. Magic doesn't work. We all know this. I argue that religion, at, on at least one level, is this notion of an illusion of qualified control, and I associate this with worship. And the notion here is that when we feel out of control, we appeal to our God, our gods, our goddesses, and this gives us a sense that we still have some sort of control over the situation. Now, if we know our Maimonides, right, we do know, especially as theodicy, we do know that God might have something else on his mind. Right? And, you know, his thoughts are not our thoughts. But yet, the idea is that if we appeal to some powerful other through worship, don't hate me for this one, through worship, which I suggest is a form of manipulation. Oh, you're so great. Oh, you're so powerful. Now do this for me. Right? This is what I would call socioeconomic intercourse with a non-natural agent. And most people will suggest people do not turn to their religions when they can handle it themselves. In moments where there seems to be your last, your last moment, you're going to turn to your God and you're going to manipulate with worship, and then for your own sense of self, you have this notion that I have some form of control. It is qualified though, because the God, as any other social agent, might do otherwise. But all the same, you still maintain a modicum of a sense of control, and this forestalls the chronic stress of lack of control. Now, what we can suggest then, um, and this is where I get to what I'm willing to argue is maybe the stress management theory. Terror management theorists, and some of you may know this, terror management theorists almost come off as drive theorists, almost like a Freudian drive theory. The fear of death is always there, and we have to deal with it. If you look at the terror management research, though, it always deals with the mortality salience prime. They're priming you for mortality salience. They're introducing the idea of death, and that may make you stressed out. You might not always be stressed out about death until it presents itself to you. So I'm willing to suggest that what we find happening here is that religion manages chronic stressors. For example, terror of annihilation and loss of control, facilitating thereby healthy immune function. Right? This is the management of chronic stress. But now here's the thing. When I talk about stress management theory, it's not always about reducing stress. Because what we have to ask is, but wait a minute. Some religious rituals are stressful, right? Here's what I find curious, and this is what Rick and I were talking about a few months ago back in Boone. Um, acute stress, right? Well, one of the things that we know is that whereas chronic stress suppresses or dysregulates immune function, acute stress often has immuno-enhancing effects. So stress can be very bad for your immune system if you're chronically stressed out. 
But an acute stressor, remember the acute stress is one of those short-term stressors. Uh, Ferdos Dabar at the Stanford University Medical Center has been doing some fabulous work on this. He argues it's the opposite for acute stress. Now, what we note is that an acute stress-induced enhancement of immune function may be an adaptive psychophysiological mechanism that confers increased immune protection following wounding or infection. Right? So if you become wounded or you're infected and you're presented with an acute stressor, it's going to enhance the immune response. Some individuals deliberately expose themselves to a form of psychological stress by watching horror films. <laughs> right? Now, get this next one. After watching the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, quote, there were statistically significant increases in peripheral circulating leukocytes, the number of activated cir circulating leukocytes, hemoglobin concentration, and hematocrit in response to the stressor. So the idea is that if you see something, here's the catch, if you see something that's potentially infectious, blood and gore, your immune system kicks into gear in advance of actually becoming infected. As Dabar has pointed out, he says it's almost like the Marines racing to the front lines when some signal comes along and says, you might be infected soon. Get ready. Now, what does this have to do with religion? Here's the catch. If you look at some of the literature in comparative religion, one ritual seems to be one of the most original or most earliest uh, in the religious traditions, and that's the blood sacrifice. Why did religious traditions engage in blood sacrifice? If you ask an economist, it looks like it's a complete waste of material without anything coming back to you, economically wasteful. What we do know, though, Greek, Aztec, Jewish, Hindu, Mayan, Tamil, they all had blood sacrificial practices. Now, we know, of course, that maybe Solomon built a temple to have some blood sacrifices done there, that sort of stuff. But one of the things, if you look at the anthropological literature, and in particular, I'm going to draw from Maurice Bloch, a French anthropologist, here's what he writes. Most commonly, sacrifices are carried out in time of trouble. Very often, the immediate cause is disease. So Maurice Bloch is identifying that blood sacrifice may have been most practiced when someone in your local community got sick. Now, granted, the emic understanding, emic description is, oh, this person has been invaded by an evil spirit and you have to do a blood sacrifice to drive off the evil spirit. Okay, right? I'm not buying it. Bloch then says, this leads us to ask the simple but century relevant question. Why does killing cattle cure people? Now, one could, of course, say, well, it doesn't, right? This is just some sort of emic sort of mistake. Or, alternatively, I think what we can maybe suggest, and this is my argument, this is what Rick and I were talking about, I'm going to suggest that blood sacrifice is an acute stressor. I'm going to argue that if someone in your local community gets sick, this is a non-pharmacological way of upregulating the immune system. And one of the things that Ferdos Dabar has noted is not only if you're already infected does the acute stressor enhance your immune response, it enhances the immune response of those in attendance as well. So notice, a stress-induced enhancement of immune function is likely to be beneficial in the context of wound healing, vaccination, or resistance to infection. Now, notice vaccination there, right? And I just took my daughter to the doctor the other day for a vaccination. She was completely stressed out, and they were all trying to calm her down. I was sitting back going, maybe she should be a little stressed, because maybe it enhances the response. There is abundant evidence that immune responses, for example, the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines, can be facilitated by stressful psychological experiences. Right? What's more, given the importance of inducing long-lasting increases in immunologic memory during vaccination, it has been suggested that the neuroendocrine stress response is nature's adjuvant, which could be psychologically and or pharmacologically manipulated to safely increase vaccine efficacy. So here's the catch. If you have a local group and one in your group becomes infected, and you decide, well, let's drive off Shitala Ama, the goddess of smallpox. So you bring along a chicken, you cut its head off. The person's already infected. They, in fact, do have an enhanced immune response. Killing the chicken may, in fact, actually heal. But what's even more curious is that the group that comes around to watch it 
is engaged in a low dose exposure to the pathogen, maybe this is also beneficial for the group at large. Get everyone around during the moment of illness and induce an acute stress response and the entire community has an up regulation of the uh, immune system. Now, I presented some of this research at the Society for Anthropology of Religion and the anthropologist basically said, oh no, 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 these people see this stuff all the time, this can't be the case. Patrick McNamara at Boston University writes, from the point of view of the individual psyche, this sort of victim sacrifice must have had profound effects. It is impossible to observe the dismemberment of even a chicken or bird without some discomfort, acute stress, even for the most practiced of executioners. So you see, dependent, and, and what he seems to be suggesting is, no matter how many chickens heads you cut off, you're still going to see blood and guts flowing, and the immune response may in fact, remain the same. Okay, I know I'm getting towards the end. I believe this is my last one. So, what is all this? The immunology of religion, right? Well, on the one hand, potentially we have, with the classical immunity, we have prophylactic priming via acute stress. Ramp up the classical immune system through a ritual of blood sacrifice. Get the, either the infected to have a more robust response or the uninfected who are potentially in a vaccinating moment. Have them have a response and notice that they said, and the immunological memory is enhanced. Remember the adapted immune system from the, that slide earlier? That enhances your adaptive immunity. When it comes to the behavioral immunity, prophylactic collectivism and what I call the geography of immunocompetence. If you're in a robust infectious disease ecology, it's good to have a collectivist society because this way you, tr you sort of protect or fend off disease transmission and contraction. Don't hang out with those guys over there. They don't practice the same hygiene codes. They have different disease agents. And one of the things we know, if you've read Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel, Cortez didn't decimate the new world with his guns and his steel. It was his old world diseases. So a, a novel disease agent is an epidemic for a locally adapted uh, community. And lastly, mimetic immunity, prophylactic reduction of chronic stress via adaptive illusions of control. If we believe through our means that we can have some sort of access to a divine agent to protect us, this enables us to have a sense, you know, we're never out of control. There's always a God we can turn to. There's always something we can do. And that's why I suggest that this is the immunology of religion. Ta-da. And we engage in safe sacrifices. And the effect that you're talking about is really what I would call a phenomenological effect. In other words, the more, it's not, it's not necessarily the blood and gore, but colors, blood, there's, no, there's nothing like blood right. to get people interested. <laughs> it's phenomenally affected. It's like a train wreck, you can't look away. You can't look away, even yeah. though, even though, People can get very used to that. I mean, if people, if people slaughter animals all the time because they want to slaughter animals when they have, when they have food to eat, right. and they don't get their food packaged in a grocery store, they've seen this sort of thing from time to time. Right. They're not disgusted by it, unlike uh, whatever his name was that said that disgust just continues on. McNamara. Not at all. It's phenomenologically fascinating. Right. Which I think, once, once human beings become sedentary, and they start doing these kinds of things, sacrificing, you're, you're taught, they, they have, I, I call it the greatest show on earth. Right. The blood sacrifices. So what, but what happens in addition, what you're, the point you're trying to make is, it also has a function. That's right. In terms of immunology. That's right, that's right. I, it, I mean, if we talk about the emic explanations for all these things, it's never in the sense of, I'm cranking up my immune system. Of course, I, that, that, that wasn't even on the horizon. I mean, this, is, this depends on germ theory and uh, immunology. Um, so yes, what I'm willing to argue and suggest is potentially that even though these communities have other explanations for what they're doing, and they often invoke the supernatural, maybe, just maybe, there is this idea that there is some sort of natural immune function response. I, I've been talking to the NSF to go study this. I actually want, because here's the thing, it, in all of these studies, when people have been exposed, and I didn't give you all the research, but they've done it with surgical videos as well. They bring people in and they expose them to a surgical video and they have the exact same immune responses. You see an uptick uh, in the immunoglobulins and saliva as if something potentially could cross the barrier, sorry, Mary Douglas, cross the actual barrier of a bio biological body 
and then I'm getting ready. I'm preparing for it. Because why wait to become infected? That's what the behavioral immune, immunology people are saying. Why wait to become infected if it's so calorically expensive, as you were suggesting? Calorie expense, that's the cash, that's the, that's the commodity or that's the value or metric in which we can sort of relate some of this, right? Whatever it takes to do that, you're taking calories away from something else. And if you become infected, and again, we all know this, fever, debility, we just crash out in our beds, we can't do anything. So better to be prepared and better to sort of potentially maybe even upregulate. Yeah, absolutely. Is this phenomenal to women too or just to men? The, the blood and guts thing. Yeah. Yeah. In, in the studies, you know, of course, we're dealing with, you know, the classic problem with Western psychological experiments. They're so sophomores at a university. Um, but, you know, but yes, but men and women, co-eds, they're all there. And yes, it's absolutely the same. Now, of course, we could potentially argue that there is some sort of recognition that some types of blood are worse than other types of blood. Right? Yeah. Yes, please. Well, first, I think this is brilliant. I just want to well, thank you. I mean, flattery gets you everywhere with me. <laughs> and so, I, I, I guess, I, this is fascinating stuff, and really, it's just brilliant. I have a question about, there's another dimension of religion. Oh, sure. Many dimensions, but yes. there is this question of, of, like when people, let's, let's say, when you go through mourning, yes, like the the whole, like, you know, one of the things of, about the mourning ritual is actually a reminder that there is a bigger world out there than your pain. Yes. So that you don't feel so isolated. You're cutting your pain, and so that's part of the. I think the, the kind of wisdom of the religious practice mm -hmm. is a kind of reminder, like a daily or bi-daily reminder, that because you're in, because the world is bigger than you, mm -hmm. therefore um, you can feel better. Is if you perceive that there is, you, it's not just being a, not just that you're not alone. It's just that. Uh, the recognition of your limit, of the limit is. So I'm just wondering how this functions in, in your mind. Sure. I, I, I love the question. Um, Here's the thing, and this sort of, you know, many people in religious studies are very reluctant to define religion. Um, and, and I understand why. We don't want to essentialize it. We don't want to make it monocausal. And clearly, this doesn't exhaust by any means the world of religion. But I am willing to argue, though, that religion stands or falls with the notion that the larger world out there is ultimately a social one. So, so on one hand, you know, you can walk out in, you know, in, in a night, dark sky and see all these stars and you can be in awe of it. But it doesn't become religion until you sort of say, but there's something social behind it all, yeah. right? And that's where I think religion really stands and falls. And so if you're in that moment of mourning, and clearly, you, you know, a lot of more, you know, some people say misery loves company. Maybe there's something to that, right? So in the moments when you're really sad, having the social support system it can be great. But what's even greater, and this goes back to Maimonides' theodicy, what is even greater is to believe that there's a social entity out there that's in control at the end of the day. Rather than, you know, some people will say, well, why did this happen? And, and, and of course, as a human animal, we, you know, and Aristotle said, you know, the man is the desire to know. But the idea is what kind of causal, uh, causality do we attribute to the negative event? Do we say, oh, well, you know, you know, poop happens, you know, just get over it. Or do we say, you know, this person deserved it in a just world hypothesis moment, that there's justice in the world and it's dispensed by a social entity. And that's why I'm sort of suggesting with this illusion of qualified control. We can't, unless we take a gun to each other's heads, and even that doesn't, uh, you know, help sometimes. But in moments of real misery, if we can basically say, but there's something social out there that's behind it, I can interact with that social thing. I 
can believe that I can persuade it, manipulate it using social tactics like worship. And that uh, gives me back that sense that I'm not ultimately out of control. God is completely in control, but I have a way of sort of sort of getting at God. And so it's not that I'm just the plaything of a blind, mute universe. There's a social reality out there. And even when the worst of things happen, we can say, but it's in God's plan. And that alone kind of gives us that sense of, well, at least it's just not meaningless and purposeless. Right? If, it's, if we are just things bumping around in an algorithm, that's very disheartening. Yeah, so I think, you know, in the moment of mourning, when we say, there's something greater than me, I'm almost willing to argue nine times out of ten that thing that's greater is still social in nature, something that we can appeal to. Yeah, correct. Just to uh, emphasize your point about it being social and more, um, yeah. in your last few statements, you said the word say probably a dozen times, mm -hmm. and that's a social act. Yes. And whether or not the person actually believes it, and if that belief does something, I can't tell, but we can identify. Yeah. That all this, just the same is important. Yes. Because it influences others. And that may, so it may be even more social than... Absolutely. It's social turtles all the way down. <laughs> yes. I, I find this fascinating. However, Thank you. But then I have to ask, yeah. how do the Dennett's and the dog can survive without this. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if Dennett, Dennett did that experiment, he was very sick. Yeah. And he did an experiment, and he asked everybody to pray for him. Yes. He didn't get better. No, no, it, it, no he didn't. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think... I think they were, way, you know, if we went with thinking systems one and two, our thinking system two can actually become a robust uh, atheist that really recognizes that we're just uh, blobs of biochemical matter and we're just bouncing around a meaningless universe. Um, again, the, the, some of the research I've seen, uh, it's the conviction of one's uh, propositional set that ultimately lends some sort of uh, benefit. It's the person who's consistently uncertain. So uh, Dawkins can have people pray for him all the time. And in fact, I remember Dennett, I think, in one of it may have been um, breaking the spell where he someone said, oh, well, I'm going to pray for you, uh, Professor Dennett. And he said, well, just don't kill anything for me. <laughs> right? You know, you, you can do whatever you want. Just don't harm anything. But I'm not going to buy into the efficacy of any of it. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, you know, it, are they realists? Or are they dirty atheists? I don't know. <laughs> yes, please. I have, um, first of all, thank you for a very, very interesting uh, lecture. You're most welcome. Uh, but I have some kind of um, an idea that, that supposedly contradicts what you say. Great, saying. absolutely. And it's um, a group, uh, well, be it Jews, be it Hindus, or if they marry inside, if they, uh, if they um, uh, exclude another group, yes. they are limiting their variety, their diversity. You are absolutely right. And then you have diseases genetically uh, passed generation from generation. That is exactly right. So how, in an evolutional point of view, how does this yes. strategy Yes, yeah, you're exactly right. Uh, too much inbreeding leads to immunological depression. And one of the things that, you know, uh, one of the things that sort of, uh, and I'm sure all of you know this, that drove some of the evolutionists crazy was this notion of why did sex ever even come up? If the idea is getting your genetic material into the next generation, asexual reproduction, that's the touchdown, right? <laughs> to, to, to use an American metaphor. Um, so the notion is that indeed sexual re reproduction came along because it produces offspring that are immunologically new. And, and one of the arguments is that if the, if the parent is infected and infectious diseases are, are rapidly evolving, trying to evade immunological detection, potentially if you reproduce asexually, the offspring will become uh, compromised by the infection being transmitted asexually to the offspring. So yes, you definitely need, uh, well, this is what the going story is, we needed sexual reproduction to produce 
produce immunological novelty to, to fight off diseases. What we see happening, and I address this in a, in a paper that I titled Disgusting Religion, Disgusting Bodies, Disgusting Religion. Um, when, if you look at India, and India is my case example, one because I, I study it historically and whatnot, um, the idea is that these castes may be hygiene uh, hygiene uh, groups and what you see in India is that there is this uh, insistence on caste endogamy only marry and sleep with people within your caste but when you get down to the fine grain analysis of it the each caste itself breaks into gotras and then into jatis so there's this idea that you can have gotra exogamy but caste endogamy so the idea is that if you have say village a right and you need to introduce new uh, novel genetic material if you look at some of the Hindu papers, it's always good Brahmin boy wants to marry good Brahmin girl. So the idea is that you can, in fact, introduce new genetic material by going out of your village and going to another village, but you're still going to try and find someone who identifies with your caste because you want to be sure that they're abiding the same hygiene codes. So without doubt, you don't want inbreeding depression of the immune system. Some genetic novelty is necessary. That said, there are moments when inbreeding does appear to be adaptive. So, um, cast common endogamy does run that risk. But if you're in a robust disease ecology like equatorial India, sometimes it may pan out to actually do a little more inbreeding than outbreeding. But there's no doubt that you're spot on, that yeah, you cannot inbreed all the time because you will end up with what they call lethal homozygosity, right? You, and that's when you have two lethal alleles that match up. You always wanted to be heterozygous. Yes? Very specific uh, conditions with dice Yes, absolutely. That 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 can occur. Mm -hmm. but, but again, what I find fascinating with some of the research is that when the more robust your disease ecology is, the more collectivist groups you're going to find. And in fact, just to be sure, um, let's see here. Yeah, here's a quote from uh, this goes back to 1994. Uh, the total number of endogamous communities in India is around 43,000 and was on the order of 75,000 at its peak. 75,000. And one of the other thing we know about Hindu India is it's most linguistically robust and diverse as well as religiously. And what's being suggested is, is that these types of tribal identities are in the service for stalling disease contraction, transmission contraction. And again, as you move away from the equator, you get more individualist groups, you get more openness to experience, you get more extroversion, you get all those other things that can be very valuable as far as sharing new ideas, but also potentially bring with it the problem of disease transmission. Um, so yes, absolutely. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah, there's another question on, on hygiene, because there's a kind of technology of hygiene, right? I mean, we, when we live in a, in a healthy society, mm -hmm. there is a whole plumbing system, Yes. there's all this infrastructure that enables us, I guess, to, to we have the luxury then to not worry. Yes. About Right, because we have this infrastructure that enables our cities to, to work. Yes. And, and, and since you're an expert of India, one of the things that's very curious is that the, actually the oldest civilizations that had cities, mm -hmm. that had plants and plumbing, was in the Indus Valley. Absolutely. And so what's curious is that, in fact, they have known this for over 2,000 years. <laughs> But yet they gave it up for this other system. That's when the Aryans came in. So what is, what is this about? Well, it, right. So, so the Indus uh, civilization is, is very well known for having an advanced um, um, public sewer system. And uh, when the Aryans came in, uh, and, and this, you know, this is all up for debate. We're not exactly sure what happened, who the Aryans were. Um, but as McNeil was sort of suggesting, the Aryans came through. Um, and maybe the caste system in the Indus civilization wasn't there as robustly as it was when the Aryans came in and displaced that kind of civilizational complex. And so if you, and this actually goes to one of my questions that I'm playing with now and, and some of the discussion earlier was pertaining to this. Um, what actually accounts for the drop in religious 
practice today. And some of the correlational data suggests, on one hand, that the more you have a social safety net in place, the less religious you're going to be. Right? So if you look at the United States, for example, one of the most uh, religiously robust areas is where I live in the southeast and we're the most religious down there and we have the least social safety net think about you know what's happening in Western Europe with their socialized medicines and whatnot so one of my questions moving forward is is there a possibility that it's the availability of public health services that actually accounts for a drop in religious practices. So that if you have less public health, you have more religion. Now that could potentially get even crazier because then you can start talking about some of the religions today that are saying don't vaccinate your children. Now if religion is in fact an infectious meme and it sees itself hitting the highway because of robust health care, then all of a sudden you have religious groups saying don't get involved with this public health care system and then the religion hangs around. So is, this is, I mean, do you see me shooting from the hip yet? So, so is there a negative relationship between the availability of public health and religious practice? We have socialized medicine here. Look at all the religious Jews that are in this country. Now, what's that all about? Anomaly. <laughs> uh, sorry, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> But, but, but we saw a slide earlier today that even said that, that Jewish people are becoming less and less observant. In which case it's really much more becoming just a, some sort of identity. That was the United States. That was the United States. Well, maybe Israel is the exception that proves the rule. Because the ultra-Orthodox don't want to become infected with the, with the meme of artificial intelligence. <laughs> There's your answer. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. <laughs> so, to, well, I have all page worth of comments, but one story, when I took our son Itai, one of the first trips to the United States, and we went into Costco, and he saw the food, the crabs, and he said, and he said what are those? Those are crabs. He said, "Ew." Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Ew. It's a disgust right. response. Right, and then, and then in the endogamy issue, the endogamy, um, the common among the Ethiopian Jews before they came to Israel yeah. is they would always go to a different village, uh -huh. but make sure there was at least ten generations separating the people who were going to be married. So they did. They they took care of both. Right. They're getting the new. Uh, immunization, immunization issues. Yes. And taking care of the hygiene. Uh, the, the exactly. <laughs> Precisely. Yes and yes. A few things that seem to read sort of also with what Paul said about Ikai. Um, that, uh, you know, in traditional Jewish communities, uh, the first things that are taught to children are purity codes. Are the, um, you know, right. are what you can eat, what you can, uh, the modes of behavior um, that are. Yeah. Is pure and, and what becomes right, hand washing and so Yeah, exactly. Um, and that is what is inculcated far earlier than, say, I know, the narratives and the, the more interesting stuff in, in, right. in, 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 the, in the Torah. Yes. So that, that's, or what is to us more interesting. I think that's always struck me as being that the purpose. The, the, um, the other thing that what you said also that about islands, um, uh -huh. immuno islands, was very you know it struck me also there was a Pew report uh, here on religion in Israel that was issued uh, earlier this year. Yeah, it's still 2016. Yeah, or issued earlier this year, and um, uh, and what they found was that at the extremes in the ultra orthodox community and the uh, very secular-minded people, right. there's almost no mixing. In other words, you, you, the, believe, the true believers don't mix well. Exactly. And that's a mimetic thing, but it could potentially have that sort of hygienic element to it as well. Yeah. Yes? Um, I was told a few months ago that, as uh, related to the ultra-ultra dogs that are getting married with each other, that there is, while there are some in 16 years or 17, they're being tested genetically, uh -huh. and they go into a, a system in which the matches afterwards, like the shidduch, they call it okay. here, they go first to this system to see if 
uh, a man and a woman can have a match, right? And then they do the match. They first um, they look into the genetic yeah. matches, uh -huh. and then they do the actual yeah. match in order to prevent the kind of the lethal allele. Yes, absolutely. It matters to us. It, I mean, this is a f again, if infectious diseases are the most robust selection pressure, how do we not at least consider some institution as robust and ubiquitous as religion not having some function there? Sorry, Mary Douglas and your followers. <laughs> <laughs> So I just on the span to Ethan, I think they always taught the Jewish kids to read Vaikra Leviticus first so that they wouldn't understand what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> and now you're saying that actually they're doing it so they can so they should understand. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, Tom. Thank you everybody.